Hello everybody and welcome. Uh, my name is James Deersley. I'm the marketing manager here at uh, Beecraft Magazine. And um, first of all, I must apologize because I'm actually operating from home today. So my uh, my video feed is not quite as good as always. Hopefully the, um, the sound is okay for you. Um, but yeah, welcome to our, our Hangout series. Basically, um, we're here to have a chat really about beekeeping and we try to pick a, a particular topic um, every month and generally I'm joined by um, a few of the Beecraft team and occasionally people from outside which obviously we positively encourage and we want you to get involved so um, incidentally if you do want to get involved or your associations want to get involved do just email me at james at b-craft.com and we'd love to have you where you guys are down here beneath me and um, what I'm conscious of is not to um, to sort of go into too much detail so what I'll just do is I'm going to introduce um, each of them in turn. So we've got here Wendy. I'm just bringing Wendy in, who's uh, the deputy marketing manager here um, alongside us at uh, Beecraft. So thanks, Wendy, for joining us. Okay. Um, we've got Michael Badger, MBE, um, joining us again, which is nice. So actually, sorry, it's first time for, for Michael. Michael, thanks for joining us. And we then have Margaret, who's our um, deputy editor of the magazine. So uh, Margaret, thank you for joining us. Hi. And then we have Jenny and Wally, um, just sort of debutantes as well, uh, joining us um, from, um, actually, where are you, Jenny and Wally? Whereabouts are you in the country? Darkest Ang Wales. Anglesey. Anglesey, there we are. So that answers the question, because obviously we're here to talk about swarming. And um, one of the things that we were just talking about um, earlier on in, in the non-live area is the time of year, because obviously with swarms, it affects people at different times of the year. Um, it's been incredibly hot the last couple of days here where I am, actually, in Surrey. Um, Wendy, you were just saying you've had a, a mass of activity over the last couple of days. And do you want to just say where you are and, and what's been going on with your side from the swarming side? Right. Well, I'm based in North Devon um, on the coast. But uh, one of my apiaries is in a nice sheltered position. And uh, I had queen cells, charged queen cells this afternoon and had to create a, a couple of nukes from... Uh, from two of my hives. So th things are really uh, going quite well down here, but it does depend still on where the apiary is located. In the more exposed areas, they're not as far ahead as that, although they've all, they all seem to be doing pretty well on um, numbers of bees. But okay. um, charge queen cells were a bit of a surprise today, and thankfully I was prepared. <laughs> yeah, I bet you were. Equipment at the ready, I would think. Absolutely. And, okay, so we've got Surrey and we've got North Devon very, very busy. Um, Jenny and Wally, I think you were saying that you were quite a way behind up there in Anglesey. How, is it um, pretty active for you at the moment or getting there? No, it's very quiet at the minute. Um, some of the more forward colonies are just beginning to get drones, but it, it, they're really not very far on at all up here. They're still... Mm, five, six frames of brood at the most. Um, okay. So that they're, they're building, they're, they're fine, they come through the wind well, but we wouldn't, it'd be a very exceptional year, and we haven't had that at the moment. It's been overcast and quite chilly for the last, last few days here. We haven't got the weather that the south has got, definitely not. Not even made temperature today. Sorry, Wally, say that again. I didn't quite catch not that. Even, I just missed you. Not even got to 10 degrees centigrade today. Oh, Christ, yeah. So they're not really sort of getting out there, I, I suppose. And um, um, Margaret, how's it going where, where you are? Well, it was uh, 19 degrees today. Uh, very, very hot and lots and lots of flowers. So I um, did a split from one very large colony, very, very busy colony. Mm. And, where, where and are you? I've heard of um, other people having had swarms already. Yeah, I've had that. I've had an awful lot of activity on the social side, saying there's been a lot of um, swarming activity around. And yes. where are you geographically? I can't quite remember. Uh, Derbyshire. Derbyshire. So right in the middle. Not quite as north as you, Michael. How, how's it going up there in um, in Yorkshire? It's cold today, but yesterday, the um, the bees were working unbelievably. Um, you know, bringing in um, pussy willow and crocus, but um, a, a week ago they were exceptionally busy. But um, today it's been as uh, though there's been one or two flying. It's not been above fifty degrees today, 
So it mm. just shows you between um, 50, uh, 50 miles between Margaret and myself, that's the difference. Yeah, it's a massive difference, isn't it? And, and Roger, you've joined us. Thanks, mate. I hope the traffic wasn't too bad for you. Um, yeah, absolute nightmare. <laughs> you? The, uh, are the bees flying? Is it getting pretty close to swarming time for you, or are you similar to the Anglesey uh, in Jenny and Wally? If reports say it's a bit erratic, to be honest. Uh, some colonies are building up really rapidly, where others are not doing so so well. But it's been today. It's been about 19 to 22 degrees. Um, I've driven from Oxfordshire today, right across back to Wales, and there's fields of oilseed rape in flower. So the, I, I assume the bees will be on that and building very rapidly. Yeah, do you know what's funny? I was on a train down just um, uh, last week, and it was amazing to see the transition of oilseed rape all the way down the train from Manchester all the way down to the south, and it was um, it was quite startling. But um, well, okay, that's great. So that that's sort of the geographical picture because we're quite um, quite spread out here. And, and once again, just for those of you who are just joining us, this is um, a big craft hangout, and we're just discussing swarming. Um, and obviously, there's a multitude of information about swarming, and, and really, this is meant to be a, a completely interactive chat. Um, amongst us all here. And just incidentally, I'm just going to um, share my screen here for a second because I want to let you all know that you can absolutely ask any questions. And we've had a load of questions coming in um, already. And all you need to do is just above, you'll be watching it here, I presume, and above here you've got this ask a question option. And if you click that down, you just um, get in here to ask a question. And what will happen is I will receive um, the questions which come to do please you know, pop any questions that you may have um, for us in there. And you know, to, to start off with, Connor, I've just received yours, so thank you for that. Um, James Ferguson's just received yours. So we'll, we'll bring all of these over in, um, in good time. So what I thought we would um, just start off with is a question that came from, uh, from Dale Gibson earlier, um, who's an urban rooftop beekeeper, and that's sort of a second part of his question. But he basically asked what um, anti-swarming techniques do the panel members favour? Because obviously there's an awful lot out there and an awful lot of different ways of controlling the bees and the swarms. And so if I sort of go from uh, left to right, um, Jenny, in answer to Dale's um, question, I know you've got a particular favourite, haven't you, in your swarm control methods. What, what do you prefer? Well, I mean, if you're talking about swarm control as in trying to um, make sure that they don't set up to swarm, um, so we would look at swarming in two ways, as, as before they've set up to swarm and once they've set up swarm cells. So before, um, the most reliable from us would be to split the colony and to do a controlled split and we would, because we run 50 hives, we would do that using a split board and our favourite split board is a snowbrook board, purely because that's what we started out with, with, with split boards. I think um, anything that splits the colony and we just use that as a vertical split in order to keep the warmth from the colony below to help uh, with queen cell formation above and also to um, give us some flexibility as to what we do with the colony that's produced on the top. Um, so that's our favourite for before they've set up swarm cells. Um, once they've set up swarm cells, uh, then our favoured way of dealing with that situation would be um, no, the name of it is Snellgrove 2 modified, but basically we keep the queen with the nurse bees, the brood, and the queen cells, and separate off the flying bees, giving the flying bees some eggs in order, frame of eggs in order to for them to make emergency queen cells, and then once they've made emergency queen cells, some nine ten days later we destroy them and put the queen back with the um, with the original colony. Meanwhile, uh, the queen cells will have been torn down, and then we leave the colony where we've taken the queen out that did have the queen cells to build more queen cells. And that way, we have never yet, since using that, had the queen and the flying bees swarm within three, four weeks of us making that split which often if you keep the queen with the flying bees, 
they'll actually abscond, they'll, they'll swarm within three weeks. And that happened to us about 50% of the time or more. So those, those are our two favoured methods. We have other ways of trying to increase the amount of area for the queen to lay in and making sure that the um, brood area is neither congested uh, nor is either with stores or with too much brood. But there we're doing using demerie, we're using uh, comb management. But the okay. splitting and snail grove two are our two favourites. Splitting and snail grove two, all right. And Margaret, what what about you? I know you, you use a non lift method, which I think is quite intriguing for, for, for me certainly, but um is that your preferred method? Yes, if I actually see swarm cells, that is queen cells with a larva and some royal jelly in it. Um, uh, the usual book method says now move your whole beehive three or four feet to one side and place an empty one instead. Now I simply can't, can't lift a whole, whole brood box full of bees anymore. So um, what I do instead is I just have an empty box about three feet away and uh, as I'm doing my inspection, I move all the brood into it until I find the queen and then I leave her behind. Oh. And you just fill up the um, box with the queen on the old site with foundation or other brood frames you've got. So it's, it uh, actually achieves a very similar end result that you've got the old queen in an empty box lots of queen pheromone now circulating around. Flying bees have joined her. Uh, she then will not swarm for another month or so. In fact, she might not swarm at all. She doesn't usually, in my experience. And then uh, three feet away, you've got all the brood, all the nurse bees, because you haven't done any shaking, and all the queen cells. But having lost the flying bees and their queen, uh, the uh, that colony will only produce one queen, in my experience. The first queen will murder all her sisters. <laughs> and uh, about a month later, you can look in and make sure she's mated correctly. It all sounds sinister in the books, but that sounds even more sinister. <laughs> <laughs> in the spoken word, but um, okay, Margaret, thank you for that. And um, and Michael, what about um, what about yourself? Um, well, the thing is, what I try and say to new beekeepers is the problem is when you've kept bees for sixty years, you get a bit blasé. But what I say to people is this: just remember this, that the bees will not swarm without a queen, and don't get hung up as well that if you clip the queen's wings that um, she won't swarm. Um, what happens is she dives off the entrance board, can't fly and either goes into the grass or comes back in. But having set that aside, what I suggest to all new beekeepers is get proficient at the pagdance and the head and swarm method. Once you become proficient at that, you um, can then start to look at other ways of controlling swarms. But um, the problem is that people say, I can't find the queen. Well, that is something I can't really tell you other than you'll always look for the queen where you will expect to find her, and that is where there's brood and eggs. And what I say to people is as well, get to mark the queen and practice on drones, because um, once you've done that, you can um, you mark a few drones, just pick them up, and hold them by the thorax and really squeeze the thorax. I don't mean to destruction, and you'll find how robust the thorax is. And just practice on drones. And when you've got really good at it, try a worker. You'll either get stung or you do it properly, and then, then you're away. But try the pagdom first. And there's plenty on the internet about the pagdom. Once you've got really good at it, there are other methods you can use, but that's what I should suggest to, to new beekeepers rather than trying to get too complicated. This, um, I agree with them um, about the snail grove. That's a good system as well. But um, just keep it simple until you've got 
into your beekeeping. Yeah, that's a very valid point, actually. And funny enough, we're going to talk about snail growth because a lot of the questions that are coming through have actually been about snail growth. Um, I just want to thank um, Alison, Lucy, and Paul, who just popped questions through. So we'll, uh, we'll try and get around to all of those. And just incidentally, before I forget, actually, is um, many of you who are watching this on the Beecroft website, not only can you ask questions, but after this, it will be recorded in the same location. And one of the recommendations I'm going to make, and don't do it now because you won't necessarily be able to ask the question, um, I'm just going to flick over to this. You'll see this button uh, part of the conversation. If you click that on a recording, what I will make sure is what Michael's just said about the packing method. Um, Wally and Jenny are talking about um, some of their stuff. They've got a booklet that they've just written. Um, we're going to put links to all of these methods, methodologies, theories, concepts in uh, that be part of the conversation bit where you can have a look at it all, download, and, um, and basically enjoy everything that we're talking about. So I hope that helps. Um, but Rodri, what about you? What, what, um, what method do you tend to prefer? Oh, that's a tricky question. Um, I, I think, as Jenny said, uh, preparation is the key. Uh, th this time of year, brood rearing is very important for honey production. You want lots of young bees coming through. So I, I would tend not to split early. Um, when there's an indication that the colony is looking to swarm, um, as Michael said, it, it physically can't swarm without a queen being present. So I would remove the, the queen on a frame with some uh, nurse bees, put her to one side, and then that way they're going to raise a new queen, which is new for that year, so you, you, you'll have a strong colony which is headed up by a fresh queen. And then you can utilize the old queen in a nuke box to, to rear a nucleus of bees then. So I, I would say queen removal, that's my technique. And I think that's termed, I think there's a nucleus method, isn't it? When you're moving them into a uh, into a nuke and you're then raising a new colony based on that. So, no, I'm um, not sure. No. Yeah, I, 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 was, <laughs> I was reading Claire's book, actually, and I think that was in there as a nucleus method. So I'll, we'll reference that in a little bit. Um, Wendy, what about you? Basically, it depends what's going on in the hive. Um, I have to say, if you don't... if if there are queen cells in the hive and you can't find the queen, then uh, I would move two frames of brood uh, with the queen cell. I'd move the queen cells out into a nuke, uh, and, but make sure that I left some eggs in the hive so that if you, if you haven't found the queen, she's going to be in either in the nuke or in the original hive. Uh, and obviously if it's whichever one has got the queen will will carry on and um, whichever one doesn't have the queen will raise their own queen um, mm. that I think is it's quite a useful thing to to bear in mind if you can't find the queen but obviously it's ideal to to, to see her and um, beforehand I would probably we were talking about doing a, um, a split today actually um, but uh, decided to, to do the nukes instead because the queen cells were present. Okay. Um, well, to, to finish off on that question for Dale, I, I prefer the artificial swarm um, purely because that's what I've always learned. I learned it from day dot, and I still do it now. Um, all I know is that you just need an awful lot of equipment to do the artificial swarms, which is means that I have literally my, my gardening shed is no longer a gardening shed. It's now purely a bee shed. Um, so that's a bit of a shame. But, um, but no, so that's what I have. But one of the things I just want to mention, there's a lot of um, new beekeepers I know watching um, uh, Gem, um, spelt Sem, and you're only the second person I've ever met with that name. One of my uh, friends at preschool, or primary school, was named Sem, Gem. Um, you're a first-time beekeeper, don't worry. We'll try and explain some of these um, little bits of terminology like splitting and um, artificial swarms and all this sort of stuff as we, as we go along. So you'll, you'll forgive us on that. Um, okay, let me just bring in a, um, a couple of questions, hopefully some, some relatively quick um, questions in here. Uh, let's have a look. So Paul Conlon, um, I think this is relatively straightforward, uh, and this is sort of like an open question. What's the best option to remove a colony from a roof space or a single story extension? It's on there about two years ago, but getting out of hand now. Um, does anyone want to pick up that one? Because I wouldn't like to necessarily be Paul at this moment. Um, come on, who wants to take the fun of that question? <laughs> Nobody volunteered. <laughs> There's no easy answer to that, though, is there? There is not an easy answer to it. Can you repeat I'll, the question? Uh, it, was, uh, 
because I was um, indisposed, as you might say. That's all right, Michael. Well, I tell you what, they, they, you should answer this one, Mike. We'll, we'll give it to you, Michael. How would you remove a swarm from a single-story extension? Um, the fun well, one. A roof space of a single-story extension. Yeah. That's not easy, right? The thing is, um, most of you are not insured to do that sort of work, so you must remember that. That is the first thing. The other thing is as well, what I suggest is that if it is difficult, you've got to be very, very careful because if you start using smoke and things like that, you set the house on fire, that's where the problems arise. Now, I won't mention his name, but one of the big people in BBKA down in Warwickshire um, got involved in a, in a situation and ended up having setting the house on fire and it caused all sorts of problems because the insurers tried to sue him as he was a professional so you've just got to be very very careful now what I would say is that if it is really difficult just um, get you know them involved with the pest control people who've got all the chemicals to get rid of them because uh, I just think that you could start something that you might regret Andrew Gibb rang me today. He's been asked to look at something and he found it very, very difficult to um, persuade them to, to get the bees destroyed. It's a very difficult one to, um, mm. to deal with, really. My own view is don't get involved in this, you know, because you might start something that you can't really finish. Yeah, I think I think that's very valuable. And it's the same with, with chimneys as well. Like, you've got to really look at the angles, look at um, you know how exposed you're going to be and, and deal with it accordingly, but you definitely need help. I mean, yeah, I've, I've been asked to do quite a few, and I, I've avoided them, I'm afraid. Um, so, Paul, that's probably not the end of news, really. Can I have a quick pop comment here, James? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Can I can I endorse what Michael said, um, that you've got to be very careful about this? I think the only realistic situation in which you can attempt to recover a, a colony from a building is if the building is undergoing repair and it, it, the, you can actually take things apart uh, without it mattering otherwise it just isn't cost effective at all if you've got to pull off face your boards or, or whatever then it's just not cost effective it's much better to get the colony killed um, there are swarms all over the place going in these places, the loss of one colony is not critical. Fair point. Good yes. answer. Okay, let's let's move on so we can move on to some others. And um, we've had one in, um, which again, I think is actually a little bit shorter than this one. So Jem has actually asked, um, if I introduce swarming techniques, will you compromise honey harvesting? <laughs> so any thoughts on that one? Well, there is a simple philosophy that um, um, they may not swarm, so don't get too hung up on it. The only problem is about um, honey production and swarm control is this. You've got to remember that um, that um, it's all to do with pheromones. If a colony is very, very strong with a young queen, the pheromones get distributed by the queen, so therefore it doesn't always produce a problem. But if the queen's old, there's not enough queen substance to go around, and that's what triggers it. So just remember that. But also, another thing that I tell people is this. Just remember a comb, a brood comb, loses 25% of its efficiency after it's two years old. So always make sure that the brood chamber has got plenty of living space. I mean, that's breeding space. And it's not cluttered up with unnecessary stores. You'd be amazed how many colonies I go to and see people with four or five frames of stores in brood nests. You know, um, obviously at the back end of the season or the very early part of the season, they need to have stores. But once they get into um, April, depends where you are, they want plenty of brood space. And so make sure that you go into a regular brood chamber comb management system so that the combs are pucker all the way through. Okay, thanks, Michael. That's great. Um, now I'm just going to say um, 
Uh, some feedback for, for Margaret. Um, Ian Sherwood, hi Ian. Uh, thanks for your, your tweets as well, really appreciate it. Um, for the first time I understand swarm control techniques and I feel I can have a go. Margaret's methods sound simple. So thanks Ian, that's very kind of you. Um, Alison Waitman, thanks for your feedback on Twitter. Very kind of you, superb. Can we do this every night? No. <laughs> 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 no. I like your enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I said that. I, I've got to put a stop on that one. Um, let's look at this. We've got a, a couple of questions. Um, um, Mark uh, Patterson, who joined us actually last month for his um, for some stuff on um, all plants and, and um, forage, has asked a question about queen clipping, which I'm going to come on to. So thanks for that. Um, just a quick one here from um, from Lucy Garden. Um, I've done a shook swarm for the first time, and the colony is recovering well, but I assume it could still decide to swarm later in the season. Is there anything I need to do other than to keep a close watch and make sure the colony has plenty of room to expand? Um, Wally and Jenny, have you got anything that you want to say on that for Lucy? Um, I mean, if, if it was shook swarmed uh, onto foundation, then that is going to be a very good way of um, certainly holding off swarming for a bit. There is a problem, though, with these early methods of delaying swarming, is that they can actually set up still later in the season to swarm. And the it's better if you're going to have a colony that you've got to split earlier in the season rather than just before the honey flow. So certainly, shook swarm won't stop them swarming. You'll certainly have delayed the way, uh, the timing for them to build up the swarm, um, because you've also you, uh, you've removed all the brood as well. So you know you you have taken a knock there, because you've take, taken away all the brood comb, presumably. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a delay, as, as she's mentioned, but um, keeping a close watch. Yeah, but you still got to keep a close eye. I mean, you, you can't assume that that's it for the end of the season. No. Okay, fair enough. So, Lucy, I hope that's um, answered in some respect. Um, okay, let's just look. There's a whole load of raft of them coming through. So, thanks for all your questions coming in. That's great. Um, let's before we go on to because um, Jenny and Wally, you've mentioned a lot about sort of pre um, sort of preventative strategies as well as um, sort of proper swarm strategies, which we'll, we'll come on to. Because I'm very conscious of explaining that to people, um, but. Before we've got that, a lot of people at this time of year, especially in the south where there's a lot of swarms happening, there was um, another question which came in, actually funny, I think it was from Lucy again, um, about luring swarms um, and bringing them into, you know, sort of bait hives and things like this. Um, so for, for beginners, bait hives are, are, are hives that you would set up to try and catch a swarm on the off chance one was nearby. Um, and, and Lucy was asked, what's the best swarm lure, please? I've heard of lemongrass oil. But I have a lot of lemon balm growing in the garden. I'm wondering if I can use that, and if so, how? Um, does anyone know much about um, bait hives and lures like that, attractants? Can I come in here, James, please? Yeah, Wally, go for it. And then, Margaret, I saw your hand was up, so we'll, we'll come on to you as well. So, Wally, what's, um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, we, we have always found that by far the best thing to do a swarm is a nice old black comb in, in a single comb in, a, in, a, in a, the bait hive which should follow the normal rules that you should put it as high as you can possibly get it and it should have an entrance which is no more than about 10 square centimetres in size and that, that is the most attractive thing to us for a swarm. There you go and Margaret following that what are, you, what are your findings on this? Yes, I was going to say the same thing. You probably want to put a foundation in a bait hive, but one frame of very old comb, nice and you know smelly and used lots of times in the middle, will help to attract the swarm. And there's a question for me, actually. Does it matter the position of your bait hive? Because I know I've seen some very elaborate construction projects where they're putting them up very high on top of sheds or... Um, on construction poles, and others say no, just put it um, on, on ground level. What, what are your thoughts on, on that? 
I, I think there's been some research, and I couldn't quote you it exactly, but I think uh, higher up is better. You think about um, a swarm going to a tree, for example, they're more likely to find the, the hollow if it's higher up. But I've had swarms come to bait eyes, and they're just at the normal height. So it doesn't matter that much, I don't think. My, my Something week. I used to do years oh, ago was um, remember that tree, bees in the wild state always live in a tree that's live. They never go into a dead tree. They're not stupid. They go high up from nature intended to be away from bears and predators, etc. So what I suggest to people is this. Get a crown board and close the entrance on the bot underneath it if you can imagine what I'm saying, have a crown board in the brood box. And as Wally rightly says, and Jenny says, some old combs in there. But if you keep the entrance quite small underneath and burn, um, drop some um, melted beeswax um, around this small entrance, because if you notice that when bees swarm into the chimney stacks, they go into these very small holes which is, you know, going back to nature, is makes it difficult for a wild animal to get into. And I found that spending this um, hot wax around this little entrance, it gives off an odour and it attracts the swarm to it. So that, that's a good way of luring it, I've found in the past. I, I'm trying to avoid having bees, so that's why I don't do it anymore. But it worked for me quite well, did that. You, that's because you just like having bees in sheds, Michael. I've seen your recent... <laughs> you know, that's what it is. You like very nicely compartmentalised in a shed. And uh, actually, a point on that, we're going to put an article of Michael's up very soon, which is, uh, which is fantastic, and actually it's the story of, of Michael's bee shed. And uh, I've got to say, Michael, I love the photos. I think it's fantastic. But... Um, that's for another day. We can't do that today. This is a shame. But look, I just want to thank um, Mike. I've just got your question, which is fantastic. I'm going to bring that in in a little bit. Um, I did mention to Mark uh, that we would talk about his thing for a second um, because I do really want us to talk about splitting of colonies. I think it's very vital right at this moment for us in the South. Um, so I'll read out um, Mark's entire question, and you'll see his, his last bit at the end. He says, he's in Central and, and can disrupt my neighbours, which, funny enough, is what Dale Gibson mentioned as the first question. Um, I clip my queens to, to delay swarming in the event I cannot get to them every six to seven days to inspect. It doesn't prevent swarms, but it does delay them, as you said quite rightly, Michael. Um, and it gives the keeper a chance to artificial swarm them. Many swarms I get called to um, to collect in central London could probably be avoided if the queens were clipped. So in a roundabout, roundabout way, um, Mark's basic question is what are the panel's view on queen clipping? Um, Michael, obviously you, you sort of suggested yours. Um, Wally and, and Jenny, have you, do you or have you got any views on queen clipping? We don't, we don't queen clip um, and we can see there are pros and cons to queen clipping. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't, wouldn't aid our particular style of beekeeping the most important um, thing against queen clipping is that you stand a very good chance of losing the only queen you've got, and you will not get another queen laying for at least a month. So when you lose a queen, you're losing at least a month's worth of brood. So we would rather try and keep on top of swarming uh, and not, not lose swarms anyway, Rather than risk, rather than being a bit have a time interval and risk losing queens. Yeah. As a, a personal point, my personal point, I I feel very uncomfortable with the idea of clipping my queen. That's my my personal view. I know it's it's a, something that is done. I know that it, it doesn't hurt queen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I just don't personally don't feel comfortable with it. One, one more thing on top well, of this. We have ruled, I'm sorry, Wally, just to be very rude here for a second. Yeah, because I'm, conscious, and I'm, I'm so sorry. Obviously, again, we, we yeah, slipped yeah. into beekeeping language, haven't we, where we just said, what about clipping, you know, queen clipping. Um, Jenny and Wally, would you mind just explaining for, for the new beekeepers here just very briefly what a 
you know, what you're doing when you're clipping queens? We, we don't clip queens. Never so done what, it. What do people do? I mean, you're, you're snipping oh, the wings away from the queen to prevent them from flying. Um, I don't know a lot about it. I mean, all you're, you're doing is you're cutting off part, part of one wing. You, you're, you're one, pair. one pair of wings. So you're, you're, you're clipping the wings so that the queen isn't going to be able to fly. And the idea is that when the colony swarms, the queen will leave the hive, but because she's unable to swarm, unable to fly, she will fall to the ground. She might crawl back in occasionally. Um, sometimes she'll crawl under the hive. Sometimes she's just down in the grass. The bees will collect around her. Because she can't fly, eventually the bees will leave her, go back to the hive. Now, because they've gone back, they aren't going to come out and swarm again until the first virgin queen is ready to fly. At that point, they will swarm with her. So you are, as you say, delaying swarming. So instead of them going, say, day eight in the um, queen, uh, the cycle of making a new queen, they're going to go somewhere about day 18 to 20, mm. depending on when that queen is ready to, to fly. She's, she's ready to fly two to four days after she emerges from the cell. Okay. So you are delaying it. So you're not, you're not queen clipping. Um, Margaret, what about you? Are you a pro or a con on the queen clipping side? Well, it's interesting. We did have uh, an article about this, and uh, I had one author who was pro it and one who was against it. And this appeared in Beecraft about seven years ago. Uh, I, um, after that article, it made me think um, that I would rather not clip queens, so I don't do that now, because it does, in effect, condemn her to die. As soon as you've clipped queen, uh, queen's wings, if she does swarm, uh, the outcome might be that she falls in the grass and can't return and she dies overnight. And that, to me, uh, you know, is just... Um, it's not how I want to beekeep, so uh, I don't do that now. No. There we go. Okay. And and Rodri, um, what about you? You are you still on the similar lines or not? Exactly the same thoughts, really, as the previous two. I think everyone's got their own style of beekeeping. Um, my personal view is I'd I'd rather not butcher a queen by clipping her wings. I I, I don't see it as necessary. You know, prevention is better for swarming rather than physically okay. manipulating the bee to try and stave it off. So. Okay, okay, it's an interesting one because I, I can I can sort of see um, Mark's point to a little bit, having been in an urban area, and I wonder whether there's an urban-rural split on this for reasons which I'll come on to. Um, Wendy, what about you? Are you a pro or a con on the... I don't really have a, a view one way or the other. I mean, we I have clipped queens and lost them. Um, but I've also clipped queens, and and but I, and they've been fine. But I think that's possibly because we've taken the correct preventative measures anyway. And um, so I think it's it's if you do clip them, I think it's important actually to do both wings slightly to keep a, an element of balance. Because the other thing is that the the bees in the hive actually might uh, reject a bee, or might reject a queen. Um, if they um, if they're found to be odd, so in, imbalanced, so that's what I was told anyway when I started beekeeping. So um, that's what I've tended to go by. If we do clip, then we would try and clip both wings equally. I think do you know I think it's a very difficult one, um, Mark, for, for, to give you my opinion on it because I I equally from a um, sort of a, a mental side, I don't necessarily agree with clipping queens, but equally I don't keep bees in a hugely urban area. And yet I understand that obviously when you're keeping bees in central London or central Manchester, Liverpool, wherever it is that for that matter, space is very much limited, which is not necessarily going to allow you to do many of the methods that we're talking about. So swarming has got to be considered from a space side, from a neighbour side, so you've got to do everything you can to prevent it. So I sort of right. understand the reason for doing it. Can I tell you, um, when I was a 
when I was a, a young beekeeper, it's a long time ago, we were we had um, a, what they call a county beekeeping advisor or inspector in those days called Harry Allen, and he suggested to us that we should always clip both queen's wings, um, which goes back to what uh, Wendy was saying. And the thing is that you've got to be, he said, there'll be less chance of them superseding the queen, mm -hmm. and there will also be the fact is that when they swarm, she can't fly very high, and you'll find that you'll have a lovely swarm four feet off the ground, or should I say, a metre and a bit off the ground. And um, now I'm in the bee house, I've started doing it again. And uh, I let one colony purposely swarm so they could show the next door neighbour, and lo and behold, she was no more than five feet off the ground on the apple tree. And it's just um, proved the point. So that's one thing you can do, but just one little bit of advice when you do try and clip a queen, be very wary that she will lift her back leg up to stop you doing it, and don't, whatever you do, slip her leg off, otherwise you will um, will certainly get her superseded. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, let's move through. Um, so, what I'm just going to do... Uh, it's time for everybody who's in the Beecroft Hangout. We're um, sort of 40 minutes in. We've got about another 20 or so minutes left. Um, and I'm just going to mention again, um, for those of you who are watching this Beecroft site, video which will be appearing probably here for you, um, there's a little um, question mark here saying ask a question. So any question you may have, please don't hesitate to, um, to ask it. We'll, we'll have it in. Um, but look, one of the things that has been asked a couple of times, and I know right from, from the start, um, you, uh, a couple of people, I think, Wendy, you said you'd split a couple of hives today, is that right? Did you split them today? Yes, yeah, well, I've taken, um, taken some of the brood out with uh, queen cells and created two nukes. Okay, so let, let's clarify what this is all about in, in terms of splitting colonies, which is basically a, a swarm, if I'm correct, a swarm prevention technique um, or a swarm delaying technique. And this is in reference to a question Alison has come in. So when is the earliest I can split a colony in order to A, expand my apiary, and B, hopefully prevent a swarm? So um, I know, uh, again, Wally and, and Jenny, you talk about splitting quite a lot. Um, would you mind just explaining what a split actually is and how people can go about doing it? Yeah. Right. Um, well, we we go about splitting when when the colony is it's got to something like eight or so frames of brood. You've got a good colony. The ideal is to split it just before the bees themselves decide to set up to swarm. Uh, so it's a bit of a tightrope to, to be, get the actually ideal time. And you have to make sure that there's enough, um, the colony's big enough, and there's also enough drones around. I mean, where we are now, it would be far too early, even with a big colony, because hardly anybody's got any drones. But we're in a very... Uh, westerly and nor northerly west um, part of the country. So you've got to know what else is around there because you've got to get a queen um, mated. What we would do is we would split the colony and we would put maybe five frames of brood and nurse bees into another colony either by the reserving all the nurse bees or we use a split board and we would put it on top of the existing hive. So you will have left in your um, original hive, you will have maybe three um, frames of brood with the queen and most of that brood will be sealed because she wants new nurse bees. She can lay eggs herself, she's an egg laying machine. But you have taken away quite a lot of the young brood, making sure there are eggs and uh, larvae and a little bit of seal brood and all and a lot of the nurse bees. We try and leave her with some of the nurse bees. And that colony that you have split, the queen remains with the flying bees. The queen keeps laying and that colony builds up. We try to put drawn comb in 
empty drawn comb in with the queen and that gives her a boost and tends to go into overdrive for laying. Uh, if we have to, we will use foundation, but we try not to. We try to get our foundation drawn elsewise, elsewhere and use uh, drawn with a, a colony that we split. The part that we have split off, that has got a good head of bees. Uh, if necessary, we will feed it and they will make emergency queen cells. They will settle down and they will raise themselves a new queen. What we will then do is if we want to make increase, we will use that new colony um, to make increase. But often or not, if it makes a good queen, we might use that new colony to replace the existing one at the end of the season. Using a split board, we often run two colonies, one on top of each other, each with supers and each with a honey crop, getting a honey crop. Does that make does that make it clear? You can't yeah, it actually give, you yeah. can't actually give a time. You can't say such and such a date is the time to split a colony. It depends purely on the colony. You want a colony where you have put the first super on and it is well populated with bees and then you're there or thereabouts for a colony that's ready to split. And your split has to be radical. Your split has to be radical enough to put it off swarming for the rest of the season. But it also you have to ensure that both halves of the split are viable, that they both have got enough bees, and that the one that's going to make a new queen has got plenty of nurse bees and plenty of young brood from which to make emergency queen cells. Okay. Okay. And Wendy, was that similar what, to what you you did today, or do you do it slightly differently? Or um, I, think, I guess we did it slightly differently in that um, we took out two frames of brood um, and made sure there was plenty of pollen and nectar um, for uh, within the nook uh, because there was actually plenty in the hive. It was a, a double brood box and. Um, I mean, we already had queen cells, so it isn't actually the same as, as Jenny and Wally are talking about. They're talking about pre, uh, before the queen yeah. cells have actually been formed. So mine's, a, you know, theirs is a, a prevention before the queen cells. Mine was a, a reaction to having the queen cells there and prevent, hopefully preventing, um, preventing swarming. But um, ours are six-frame nukes. So we had two, um, two frames with um, with brood um, and shook a lot of nurse bees in, obviously into the uh, into the nuke. Um, as I say, two two frames of brood, two frames of one frame of pollen um, and one frame of stores and two drawn comb. So slightly, I mean, ever so slightly differently. So that's that's one of the things. I mean, it's but different different timing. You've got to bear that in mind, James. It's different timing. Gen, you know, Jenny and Wally are talking about before the swarm cells appear. Okay, because one of the questions, or a lot of the questions that are coming through, are all about um, about this prevention side, and a lot of them are saying, are we would we split a colony in order to provide space for the colonies, or you know, what would you rather um, add this about before you start splitting. A colony will only swarm when it has its own drones flying. You've got to make sure that the drones, that it has got drones that are on the wing. And until they're on the wing, that colony will swarm. Uh, a lot of people used to say, wait until you see the, vi what's it, the ribes growing and flowering and that sort of thing. It's nothing of the sort because of climate change now. Things are much earlier. If you see a colony of your own with drones flying from it, from that time onwards, they are in a position to swarm. That is the major thing that people overlook. So um, people go, uh, a, a young lady not so long uh, last year split a colony far too early and um, said it's all gone wrong. Can I help her? I went down. And I said, but why have you split it? She said, well, it was strong, but there were no drones flying, you see. So she messed it all up. So just remember that. It's a good point because it's actually, funny enough, that may answer um, Trevor Boulin. I think, I apologize if I pronounced your surname wrong, Trevor, but um, he's just put on here one of my highest as more drone cells than I've ever seen before. 
Um, have you got any suggestions? So I suppose one suggestion is what you're just alluding to there, is it, Michael? That um, I was told if a colony's got more than five percent of drones, then you've got to start thinking they're getting prepared for swarming. Is that is that an accurate? Oh, figure? I think that's a sensible thing. But um, just another thing is a lot of people try and eradicate drones completely from a hive. That is false, totally false. A colony is happy when it has got drones, but then again, you don't want too many. Now, you can put brand new foundation in, and very quickly, they will transfer some of it, transition into drone. It's because it's part of their natural rhythm. But obviously, as I said earlier, I'm sure I said it earlier, about 25% efficiency in drone combs. That's one of the things. If you keep through, keep a regular comb change procedure, you'll cut down a lot of the problems with swarming. James, James could I mention that uh, in the May issue of Beecraft, which is just uh, coming up soon, uh, we have an article by Dinah Sweet on making increase and it will also prevent swarms. So it's uh, covering the, the um, information that we've talked about today. James, Sorry, Michael, you were, you were crackling up a little bit there. Do you want to just say that again? Uh, she's written, I've seen this article because um, I've been asked to write something about queen rearing. And I read Di what Dinah had written, and it's very, very good about preemptive swarm control. Very much like what Wally and um, Jenny mentioned earlier about getting things right. So it's well, it, it's a good, good well-written article. Right, and that's coming up in uh, this. This. Sorry, one, if, you, if you're watching this for uh, who who are a B Cross subscriber, then you'll probably get this. in. is it the next edition? Yes, oh, the yeah. May edition. The May edition, fantastic. So that'll be out soon, so we'll make sure that's all gone. Um, Can, Wendy, you were, you were going to say something as well? Yes, I was just going to say uh, that um, as long as there's worker brood in uh, the, the chat that's rung in uh, or emailed in, as long as there's worker brood, then um, I wouldn't be worried. But if he's got, if he's not mentioned whether there's any worker brood in there. Um, so I would just be wary if there's an awful lot of, of drone brood that um, she could possibly be a drone layer. Um, I don't know whether that would happen first thing in the this sort of time of year. Probably Jenny or Michael can uh, can pass comment on that. But um, if there's if there's not much in the way of worker brood, I would be a bit concerned from that point of view. It does, and we have two of them at the moment. We've got you do. two two of the winter as drone layers. Right. So, so it is possible in that case so yeah. to have a drone layer at this time of year. They went, so They went into the winter laying perfectly normally and have come out as drone layers. And so just, in, just for clarification for those of you um, who perhaps uh, are not as experienced as these guys, um, your advice, Jenny and, uh, and Wally, if you have queens coming out of um, winter uh, as drone layers, would you replace the queens? Requeen the colony. If if the colony has got some workers in, if not, forget that colony because most if it's been a drone layer early in the season, then there won't have been any replacement of the autumn bees, and so what you've got is a load of very old bees there. So you're almost going to have to start again. If it's a drone layer later in the season, is laying perfectly well and coming in later then there's a hope that you can requeen that colony. But this time of year, we, we would just end those colonies and we'll, we'll make increase and replace them. A good sign for a drone laying queen at this time of the year is if you see a good healthy colony, you'll see the bees coming in with saddlebags of pollen on. If you've got a drone laying queen, you'll see that the, drone, the, the bees that are bringing in pollen have got very small um, amounts of pollen on the le on, in a pollen basket. That's about the best guide without sort of um, you know um, going into it in great depth without seeing a colony at first hand. Okay, all right. Look, we've only got five minutes left. Um, I'm just conscious of um, trying to answer some of the other questions coming through. There's so many that it's. Um, I'm just if I'm not getting 
um, back to you. I've got one of the one of the issues about um, swarming at this time of year, from what I understand, is space. There's a lot of issue with with colonies coming out very very powerfully in um, uh, in the spring, and I've had issues with this in the past because I run polys like you do, Wendy. Where obviously poly, what I've found is my poly hives come out booming in spring. Um, and they struggle for space and therefore they go, well, hang on a minute, we must find a new home, so they, they split. Um, and there's a question which came in here, which is, um, if you have a 14 by 12 brood box and it's getting full, are you better off adding a super or another 14 by 12 brood box to give them more room? Um, <laughs> now, I, I have to say, I've only ever added, added super, because I, I run 14 by 12s, I've only ever add, run supers. Any other um, uh, sort of thoughts on that? Because I'm interested in that one. Well, actually, I mean, I've, I run Langstroth poly, uh, poly hives, and uh, I had a double brood that was bursting a month ago um, with bees, and I put another brood box on the top drawn comb, and uh, I've gone back a few days ago, and it is just, although there's one frame that the queen has laid in, um, the other frames are absolutely solid with nectar, um, to the point that I've put another box on. <laughs> But I think probably I should have put a, a super on with a queen excluder, but I, it just seemed too early to be doing that. So I would be, um, I would welcome a, a view on that as well, actually, Jane. Yeah. The only problem with using 14 by 12s or even nationals on brooders is, as Margaret quite rightly said earlier on, it's a question of lifting them, you see. You've got to remember that. They're quite heavy once they get um, full of nectar. Now, one other thing, I mentioned it earlier about 25% loss, and you'd be amazed how many people are not aware that the colonies that they've got, are, the space that's available to them is restricted by more than what I was saying. So have a good look at your combs, and if they're poor combs, that is the thing to do. Now, a lot of people do go in for double brood, sorry, double brood chamber management. You need to be fairly, you know, strong to lift them on and off. But the other thing is as well, if you go in for double brood chamber management, by about the first week in June, you need to put a queen excluder between the two boxes because what you'll end up is rearing a whole amount of brood that the bees, when they go out and forage, come back to feed a load of young bees rather than storing it in the in the. So it's a fine balance. You've got to be very very careful. Okay, well let's tell you what. Let's um because we've only got a few minutes left, and I'm, I'm very conscious we we've, we've actually barely been able to cover um, a lot. It just shows you the sort of the, the wealth of um, information and and questions which are out there. Um, let me just, I'm going to bring in a couple. This is a very quick one from Owen. So, Owen, thank you for bringing this in. Um, and, Margaret, maybe you can answer this one for us if you don't mind. Um, he just said, will my bees swarm even though they are relatively small in number within the hive? Well, if you have a very small hive, um, I suppose, if you had a smith hive or something like that. But, uh, on the whole, if there's plenty of room for the queen pheromone to circulate around, um, then they are much less likely to swarm. It's when the queen pheromone can't um, circulate amongst the workers so that they don't get enough because it's so congested, that's when they uh, will consider swarming. Okay, and what else have we got here? James Ferguson put this question in here. Um, interesting one, actually. Uh, he puts, um, after collecting a swarm, is there a need, is there a need, is there a need, to, need to quarantine Apiary with existing and active colonies. Um, if indeed so, how long would you quarantine the, uh, the, the swarm? Any thoughts on that? It depends if you know where the swarm is from. If it's from one of your own apiary, one of your own hives, no, I'm getting awful of stupid. Yeah, I don't know where those come from, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. If if you know if you know it's come from one of your hives then it's fine. But if it's it's a wild swarm that you've just got to you just then yes, sort of segregate it. Put it somewhere separate because you know that it's um free of disease and That would be my response. 
Yeah, that's what I've heard before, is try and ha have an intermediary before you move it into your own apiary and have a couple of inspections, making sure it's all free of disease. So that's actually funny. When it, that's exactly what I've, I, would, I had been advised beforehand. Um, okay, well, look, we're, we are now um, out of time. So let me just see if there's a very quick one I can answer in here. Yeah, there was a question earlier on, because I know I can answer this, which, um, which came through actually before this started, and we haven't even got on to, very, I, I'm very sorry for it, we haven't got on to anything like the artificial swarm techniques and the no, non-lift techniques, which, which Margaret uses, um, but we will make sure we've got links, and I'll explain in a minute um, from this video where you can access these. Um, somebody asked a question about, with an artificial swarm, how long is the interval between moving the old hive to another side of the new hive so that more flying bees can return to the old queen. Um, it's, a, it's a very quick answer. It's at least seven days was, was, the, uh, was the answer, which is in most of the books and certainly what I've, I've followed through. Um, so I think really on that point, just looking at all of these, yeah, there, there's so many in here. We can't answer all of them, I'm afraid. So we're going to have to um, end the uh, sort of the broadcast on that note. Um, just as a final sort of run through, are there any last and short tips that um, that any of you might have for people who are um, sort of concerned about this at all? Is there have any of you got any pearls of wisdom that um, that you can share? Well, if you yeah. haven't, I'm going to give you one because Jenny, I know you um, mentioned something to me the other day, which is we should never ever be we should never be fearful of, of bees swarming because ultimately that's what they're there to do. Absolutely, if they weren't swarming, it wouldn't be a good Absolutely. place. Yeah. Um, and any um, colony, you shouldn't be surprised. Nice. Nice. That your colony nice. setting up to swarm nice. means you're a poor bee. Because, because, because your colony is healthy, your colony is strong enough to swarm. And, swarm. and, and, it's, really and it's really it's what they want to do. Get on top, Get of, on it. top keep, of it. Keep 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 learn, learn how to manage it. Learn how to manage it. Don't be that's what they're gonna do. That's what they're gonna do. Yeah, exactly. My tip is my tip is my tip is have expect almost anything and have the equipment ready and available to deal with it in the season. Yeah, um my tip. I think that would mine would be if you are stuck for for time, then to try and give the bees more space. Um, I think it's the the points that have been made about the the bees storing the nectar in the in the brood chamber uh, is a very valid one about actually taking frames of um, of stores out and giving the queen somewhere else to lay. Um, I think that is a, a bit of a preventative um, preventative measure that that I've used in the past. Sorry, I'm just trying to James. I know, I'm sorry. My wife was following me saying, where are you? Where are you? I'm going, I want a hang-up call. I can't, I can't go. Are you okay? I'm fine. I'm fine. Uh, um, anyway, James, so. One thing I would suggest that every big keeper should have is quite a few butler cages. And if you buy them, Scold them with Scold boiling them water. Them water, 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 water. <laughs> and um, at the first, um, at the first, get the queen into them. And then when you want to find, you want to find, you're going to push the front of it, and she'll go in there try and find the queen. Now, what I say about is that there are here. To find the queen, you can put it in your top, in your top and then if you've got queen cells, you, you can put it down and think, what do I do? Give you time. Give you time. Mm. Very, very valid advice. That's the thing, isn't it? Don't stress and don't panic with it all. And, and I think for any, for any beekeeper out there, certainly from, from my respect, you know what? You, you will mess things up. You will muck things up. What, don't be stressed about it. Don't worry about it. Don't be scared. There are plenty of resources out there where you can find information. In, if, in fact, if you're watching this as a recording, and this is a nice link into this, um, which should be in the bottom left of your corner, the B part of the conversation, click on that, and lots of different articles are load up into here, access onto the various different techniques that we sadly didn't get around to talking about. 
Um, but hopefully that will help you out. So don't get stressed. We'll work it up and um, just learn as much as you possibly can. And I hope that will help. So on that note, I'm going to finish this. Um, once again, this was uh, one of the, the Beecraft Hangouts that we do um, on a once, by, uh, once a month basis. Um, sadly, Alison wants us to do it every night. Um, we, we're not going to do that. Um, <laughs> it's almost impossible. Um, but thank you for your time. Uh, Beecroft Magazine, uh, we are the informed voice of British beekeeping. Um, we like to think it's actually beekeeping on the whole, not just British, but it's informed. We try and inform you. Obviously, there are lots of many different opinions for the, for the good and bad in beekeeping, but ultimately, we just try and inform you to make your own decisions, and that's what the Hangout's all about. So we hope these help you. And... Um, this will be repurposed as an article on the Beecroft site soon, um, so we hope you'll uh, you'll find it there as well and, and rewatch it if you need to. But um, thanks for your time, everybody, and um, and thanks to Wendy. Thanks for joining us, Wendy, and Rodri. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, and Michael, and Margaret, and Jenny, and Walter at the end there. So thanks, guys, and good night. Happy beekeeping. Oh, good see night, you at the spring convention. Bye. 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 Bye.